I am Anna Amperky, and in this Invisible Histories of Indie Games panel, I want to dispute a few of the myths that I think are kind of commonplace about indie game history. So, here's one. Cave Story came out in like, what, 2004? Um, and Cave Story was the first indie game. Um, it was a game made by Daisuke Amaya, a uh, Japanese man who I think was um, working in an office and making this game on the side. That was the first actual indie game. Another myth is that Twine, um, the, the free hypertext game making tool by Chris Clements, um, created the personal game. Um, and Twine, for all, for all its importance, for all that it's done to democratize a lot of game creation, um, the idea that all personal games started in the <coughs> early 20X teens um, is also a surprisingly pervasive indie game myth. And not only did Twine invent personal games, um, Twine also invented queerness. There were no, there were no <laughs> queer games until Twine came along. Um, so, catalyzed by a deep DIY game making tools for non-engineers, um, a generation of male gamers and game developers was confronted with the existence of gender for the first time in their lives. <laughs> and suddenly now, queer games are everywhere. Um, and by everywhere, I mean niche communities on the internet that generate no money. <laughs> Now, when we say queer games, what we usually actually mean, without actually acknowledging it, is trans women. I don't say that to mean that trans women are some kind of gatekeepers to whatever queer games is. Um, the fact that I'm wearing a key around my neck is totally incidental. Um, <laughs> Accusations like that, which have been said by real people, um, and the reason that we often use the term queer game scene instead of amazing trans lady game making heroes, are a response to the sudden visibility of trans women, DIY game makers, in an artistic form in which the mainstream doesn't expect to see them. Um, and if we're being honest, that describes any artistic form other than maybe the memoir. So, digital games weren't really prepared for a group of people who are normally voiceless, both inside and outside of games, to take the lead in dragging the art form out of the dark ages and into the shining and boundless future. Um, it's been an adjustment process for everyone, um, adjusting to the, the fact that this group, who we usually pretend don't exist, are in fact doing the most important work in the forum. Um, but here we are now, gathered in this room to acknowledge that trans women who came out of nowhere and have existed at most for three or four years <laughs> are now suddenly and for no reason a creative force in games. That version of indie game history is a little short-sighted. The truth is, trans women invented indie games. <laughs> Now, DIY game making communities existed before 2000, and trans women have, in fact, been involved in the, in the industry and in indie game development in a lot of avenues, in a lot of ways. Um, in fact, in John's talk earlier, he mentioned, he mentioned Danny Bunton Berry, the author of Mule and Seven Cities of Gold. Um, but I'm going to talk about one particular game making community from the 90s. Um, but there are there are plenty, there are plenty, have been plenty of game making communities all over the world that usually are left out of our sort of Amerocentric history, America centric. Um, ask someone who grew up with the ZX Spectrum what their first indie game was. Um, right now, though, we're going to talk about ZZT. This is the title screen of a game called Town of ZZT, which was released in 1991 by Atomic Computer Systems who later became known as Epic Mega Games, who later still became known as Epic Games, the creators of Years of War. ZZT was the very first game 
made by Tim Sweeney, who, the founder of Potomac and later Epic Games. He made it while he was living in his parents' house, and so he had very little overhead, which is convenient if you're starting a company. Um, and so, so yeah, so Tim was attending the University of Maryland during the day, working on this little game by night. And in fact, according to an interview he gave a few years ago, um, his dad has been receiving order forms for ZZT for the past 20 years. Um, only a couple years ago did he actually send out the final copy, uh, which is owned by one Zach Willer. So a brief note on uh, pronunciation. Tim Sweeney, um, in that same interview that I just cited, uh, claims that he intended ZZT to be pronounced as a single syllable, like a, like a sound effect, like zzzz, like someone getting electrocuted. Um, in actuality, the reason that the title starts with two Z's it's probably closer to the reason that Aardvark laser engraving <laughs> in Oakland chose its name. Um, when ZZT appeared on bulletin boards, shareware collections, and eventually CDs containing hundreds of games, the name ensured that it filtered alphabetically to the very bottom of every list, um, helping one imagines for it to stick out. Um, so I'm just gonna call it ZZT. Um, if anyone has any objections to that, please leave now. <laughs> okay. so, so as I said, CZT was distributed as shareware. Um, this was before a worldwide connected internet existed. Um, instead, there were localized internets. There were BBSs, bulletin board systems, localized communities. So shareware was a strategy for distributing games across BBSs. Um, you can see here the um, shareware plea that um, that um, <coughs> popped up at the, whenever you closed the original version of ZZT, imploring users to try and upload the game to as many different BBSs as possible and help it spread across the United States and eventually the world. So Town of ZZT, which I just showed you the title screen of, is the sort of free episode of ZZT. Uh, you could download that on your BBS if your BBS had it. Um, Odd Mine came on a disc. But if you liked Town of ZZT, you could send away for the other episodes, um, which are Caves of ZZT, Dungeons of ZZT, and City of ZZT, my personal favorite. Eight dollars for each of them, or order all four for $24, which is actually the same price as buying Caves, Dungeon, and CD, CD individually. Um, buy them all and save. <laughs> Lots of creators, um, in addition to Tim Sweeney and Potomac, were working within this kind of shareware model. But not all of them were necessarily in it for, for profit. Um, a lot of it, there were in fact a lot of people who were um, building games as postcardware. Uh, if you like this game, send me a postcard from the place in the world that you are um, and build up, you know, a little collection. Um, but for Sweeney, this economic model was very, very successful and allowed him to fund the creation of new games. Um, his next game would be Jill of the Jungle, um, which is also, also a pretty amazing game um, that I'm not going to go into. Um, but that he co-designed with Alan Pilgrim who is someone who entered Epic Mega Games through a ZZT world editing contest. Um, so because of the success of ZZT and later Jill of the Jungle, um, uh, Atomic Computer Systems and later Epic Mega Games were able to become a publisher and distributor to license games from other developers to hire new employees to expand Epic Mega Games into one of the larger shareware games publishers and distributors in the 90s, and ultimately into the epic, the epic games that we know today. The story of Epic Making Games is actually pretty interesting, um, but what I'm gonna talk about today is the story of ZZT and the communities that it engendered. Um, so ZZT, as I sort of just hinted, is not just the four games that Tim made and was distributing. Um, the editor, in fact, was a free part of the game. 
and creating ZZT games, playing games by others, and distributing those files did not require registration. Which I feel is not the sort of um, economic choice that a platform like this would make today. Um, but it was important that at this moment in time, um, Tim Sweeney decided to let the creating part of the game um, be part of the free part of the free part of the game. Um, so ZZT's um, world editor is what allowed it to be not merely a game series, but a platform and eventually a community. Um, so although ZZT is, is kind of simple looking, it actually contains a scripting language uh, called ZZT OOP for object oriented programming. That's incredibly robust, especially for our first programming language, as it was for most of ZZT's users. Uh, if you look at the example above, um, I'm just gonna try and explain this a little. So this object, uh, which happens to be a little black cat, um, first will we'll end and wait to receive a touch message from the player, which means the player is physically bumping into the object. Um, and then it will, it will show a message and give the player a single point um, and play a little sound, a sound effect, which would have been a PC speaker sound effect because no sound cards yet. Um, and then it does a little animation. Um, the, the char command, short for character, is changing the character that's used to represent the object. So this, is, this animation is flickering between two different uh, characters. The I in between is an idle frame. Um, CZT scripting language is so robust, in fact, that people have used it to make way more types of games than Tim Sweeney probably ever anticipated. Um, this is a lemmings-like game, where the player manipulates a cursor to build paths for a creature that will move around on its own. You can see that the, the, the player is sort of trapped in the area with little arrow buttons that they're using to manipulate this cursor and build platforms for this little creature. This is a side-scrolling platform game. This is a Final Fantasy style RPG battle system. This is Pinball. It doesn't actually play very well, um, but it's pretty fascinating that it exists at all. This is a friggin' Mandelbrot fractal visualizer. <laughs> it took, it's really, really, really slow. This took me three days to produce. Um, and I have no idea how it works. <laughs> this was actually this was actually made a few years ago um, as part of a sort of demo package that includes um, an artificial life visualizer, a scientific calculator, all that are like running on CC2, and like physical game objects moving around, interacting with each other. So because CCT was made in MS DOS text mode, which is a built-in system for designed for displaying text and nothing else. Um, every single thing in the game has to be represented by one of these 255 text glyphs that are in the character set, um, which is why the smiley face shows up in so much of ZZT, because it's one of the most emotive characters in the set. You can see that there's also um, there are also a lot of Greek symbols. There are playing card symbols. Um, you know, spades would end up becoming trees a lot of the time. Um, clubs could become bushes. Um, the the Venus symbol, or what we think of a lot of times as the female symbol, um, ended up becoming the icon for keys in the game. And so the goal object of most of the original CCT games is to like uncover purple keys and bring them back to a magical palace. So objects in ZZT are restricted to 255 stock characters and only 16 different colors in, doc, in text mode. Um, each character gets two colors, a foreground color and a background color. If you look over at the bottom right of the editor though, you can see that it only lets the user pick from seven out of 16 colors. Um, so that's actually a foreground color with black as the background color. So of all the possible different color combinations, ZZT only lets you create seven out of the box. Um, 
This was until the ZZT Super Toolkit was created by hex editing ZZT to allow for other combinations, other color combinations that authors could then use in their games. So uh, opposed to the seven colors, the seven color combinations um, that ZZT lets you do out of the box, this screen shows 128 different color combinations, uh, combinations of foreground and background colors. Um, and so because of, because of Super, because of the Super Toolkit, um, ZDT games could look like this. Um, so the Super Toolkit became an essential tool for everyone creating with ZDT and shaped the creation of games like uh, this one, Edible Vomit, which is about the consequences of drug use, um, designed by a teenager who had never been high in his life at that point. Um, <laughs> This is Kudzu, uh, which is a surrealist dream adventure. This room is the Hall of Famous People, and um, all, of, all of the famous people, as you can see, are, are behind glass, um, with little, little plaques that, that um, provide information on them and their, and their professions. Um, and this is Eli's House, which is a game about nostalgia and history, sort of a retelling of The Great Gatsby, and also sort of about the history of ZZT and the people who used it. Um, when is the most recent game of the ones I'm showing you? So, Super Toolkit was created by Alexis Jensen, Alexis Jensen, excuse me, who is now one of the lead designers for Magic the Gathering. This is pretty, pretty neat. Um, so even though the games that I've shown so far um, aren't actually by authors who I know to be trans women because I, am, because I understand how fraught um, showing the childhood works of, of trans women that they create under their birth names can be. I decided to omit um, like actual CCT games by trans women from this slideshow, but even though I, even, even though I haven't um, including games by trans authors, you can see that everyone who's created ZZT games has done so using tools built by a trans woman. And so everyone for whom ZZT was a gateway into becoming part of the games industry, they all got their start using tools built by a trans woman. Trans women's presence in game making, in personal and DIY game movements, is nothing new. Um, when John Romero was designing the first levels for Doom, trans women were building one of the earliest DIY game making communities. Trans women have always been at the forefront of populist game creation, and their often unsung labor is one of the secret histories of indie games. I wanted at this point to show my book a little, um, but it's actually sold out the merch table. Um, but um, yeah, so I've so I've written a book about ZZT in which I've interviewed some of the creators of the games that I show here, including Alexis Jansen, the creator of the Super Toolkit. Um, if you're interested in anything I said, further reading. Thank you.